Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada and the same unlimited obeisances in the dust of the lotus feet of my most worshipful Shiksha Gurudev, Nichalila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pad, Astotara Sat Shri Srimad, Srila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj, to all of our Guru Varga, our disciplic succession of self-realized gurus, and to all the assembled devotees. Thank you all for coming this morning. I know you had other choices, so thank you for coming here. Um, at this auspicious holy place, which uh, Srila Gurudev himself calls all the places that Srila Prabhupada has been to, uh, Maha 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 Tirthas, that is great, 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 great holy places. We're going to share some of the early uh, memories that I have of Srila Prabhupada, which began from this tree. So, I met Srila Prabhupada in 1966, and I was, I had no knowledge of the Hare Krishna movement. I never heard of the word Krishna. <laughs> and I was just passing through the um, park on my way to a friend's house. Do you remember which uh, entrance you were from? Huh? Do you remember from which direction? <laughs> um, maybe it'll come to me as I'm talking. And all of a sudden, I heard lots of different kinds of instruments. I think many of you have seen the video of Srila Prabhupada um, at Tompkins Square Park with all kinds of flutes and drones of harmoniums and uh, what do you call those tambourines and cymbals, cartels. And so I heard that music and big, big drums like that, the bongo drums. So I became attracted to the sound and saw Prabhupada sitting on this red uh, Indian rug with his about 10 followers dancing uh, in front of him on the rug, just a couple of them dressed in uh, Vedic garments, the others just like regular New Yorkers. And Prabhupada was chanting Hare Krishna, and my first impression was, this looks, he looks like a genie who just flew in on a magic carpet. And my impression is still like that, it hasn't changed. And then uh, there were about three or four hundred people, and in those days there was a big thing of the Statue of Liberty and America being the land of the free, so there were so many refugees from different countries also there, lots of hippies playing the flutes and a lot of people intoxicated on LSD and uh, many people dancing uh, in, uh, with beautiful moods. You've seen the videos. And Srila Prabhupada was standing in front of the tree and he said, thank you very much for participating in this Krishna consciousness movement. And then he said, nobody will check you, nobody will stop you, nobody will tax you, there's no loss, and the gain is terrific. Take this Sankirtan movement of the chanting of Hare Krishna home with you, and be happy. And then uh, there was more chanting, and then his disciples rolled up the rug and they all left and there I was standing there and then wondering what to do but expecting something would happen so this total stranger I'd never seen before in my life walked up to me and said would you like me to take you to the temple so I'd never heard of the temple before but I said okay so we walked the nine blocks to uh, second avenue in between 1st and 2nd Streets, where the Matchless Gifts store, Prabhupada's first temple, is. And there was a big sign in there with those, you know, the black sign with the white letters that you stick on about Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita classes. And uh, then we went in, and first thing, there was 
the same devotees who were singing in the park were dancing around in a circle in the temple room. And I was, somebody uh, gave me a japati, which I immediately thought was completely intoxicating. <laughs> and then I was over, as I was honoring it, I was overhearing two of the uh, males speaking two brahmacharis speaking, that did you hear what Swamiji just said? They said, he said that whenever God brothers have arguments, they should consider those arguments as insignificant as clouds passing by. When clouds pass by, you don't even know that they're passing by. It's so insignificant. And then somebody immediately asked me would I like to go up to Swamiji's apartment. So sure. So we went up there and Prabhupada was reciprocating with everybody according to how they wanted to reciprocate with him. Somebody wanted to shake his hands or embrace him or bow down to him or just talk to him like a buddy. Whatever it was, he was reciprocating in a very friendly way. And then, uh, oh, first, I mean, just to tell you where I was at, uh, Prabhupada, he once said that when you're in an airplane, you don't know how high you are, right? You're just sitting there in this room. But then when you look out the window to see where you were before down there and with all these little dots, then you can see how high up you are. So where I was, uh, was that the first room I went to in Prabhupada's quarters when the person invited me up was the room that they had just had an initiation in. In, in the morning and then in the afternoon they went out for the kirtan with Prabhupada and so there were flowers everywhere and uh, grains thrown because you throw grains into the fire sacrifice and people were chanting japa and I couldn't tell what they were chanting and they were bowing down and I thought that they were bowing down to the floor <laughs> because everything is God including the floor that's where I was at. And another thing that will show where I was at was that when somebody asked would I like to go into Prabhupada's back room where he was greeting so many guests and speaking with devotees. You know, it says in the Bhagavad Gita that one should approach a bona fide self-realized spiritual master, inquire of him submissively and render service unto him, and that self-realized soul will impart knowledge unto you because he has seen the truth. So the first question that I asked him was, I'm on LSD now. Can I just stay here permanently and not come down? So, Prabhupada, you know, this is imperfect questions, perfect answers. Uh, Prabhupada's reply was, no, because it's a material process and therefore it's temporary. And then he said, we are eternal and everything around us is temporary. And then he asked if I live near here, nearby, Nearby meant at 26 Second Avenue, and I lived by Pelham Parkway in the Bronx, which is an hour and a half, five subway ride trip. And because because I thought that I was the all-pervading God, I said to him, "Oh yes, I live very near." <laughs> <laughs> and so Prabhupada said, "Good." then you can come every morning for classes. <laughs> and because Prabhupada is such a sankalpa, which means that whatever he says happens, there's truth, power in his words. So I started trekking down the next day from the Bronx every day for an hour and a half to come to his seven o'clock programs, which included the most amazing morning tunes. Like we know one morning tune. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. But every morning practically was a different morning tune. One was Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And uh, so he was on this purple uh, Vyasasana and um, on the side of the Vyasasana, purple velvet, on the two sides of him, you've probably seen the pictures in the Lilamrita, 
or elsewhere. There were two big vases of uh, long gladiolas on the two sides of him, so he looked like he was in Vrindavan Forest. And then on the side, down near the floor, there was a gong that was this big. And he always wanted somebody to play the gong during the kirtan. And he always wanted Kirtanananda to play the tempura. Da, 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 da. And that made such a beautiful drone. And then somebody else, uh, like Satsrup or somebody, usually Satsrup at that time was playing the harmonium, but nobody knew the notes. So it was just a drone, but it was marvelous. The whole thing sounded so mystical.